LIGO never had a calibration curve. The LIGO collaboration, they said, said that they did when they, in the original paper, right? The, the LIGO team reported that they detected gravitational waves, for instance, right? But it's quite ridiculous when you find out what the reality is, right? Because they never published a lot of things about their claims. And then they published things that were not true about their claims, right? So let's start with one that they published, which is not true about their claims. And then we'll come to one, the other one I said. Uh, that there is no calibration curve. LIGO never had a calibration curve. Can we just break that down for people, you know, what, what a calibration curve is and why it's important? Well, in the LIGO machine, essentially it's a laser that's uh, being bounced off of mirrors, right? And so you take an, a, a known laser input and you measure the output, right? And that can give you a, a calibration for your device. So that when you get any other signals coming in, you've got something you can compare it to and to see if it's a real or not, right? And to show that your device actually works. Right? So if you can't produce a calibration curve, you haven't proved that your device can do anything. In other so, words, you, they have this system set up where they have some, some long, really long hallways where they have these lasers, right? And if there's disturbances in the hallway due to you know, a truck going by or a gravitational wave, allegedly, uh, it should alter the dimensions of the cavity, which, or the path of the laser, let's say, which will result in some phase interference uh, as the laser is, you know, remixed with itself through some mirror system, essentially, right? Is that a fair way of putting More or less. Yeah, that's More a simple way to put it, okay. But you so need to know what sorts of deflections Res, uh, would result from some standardized uh, disturbance or something like that. That's right. right. And so if you don't have that, how do you calibrate the the change that results, which is measured, versus what your expected change should be later on? And, and, and when you compare it to your library of possibilities for what it could be, something like that. Yeah. Well, you've got to remember that the, the, the range of deflections is, is in the atometer range. We're talking really, really tiny, right? And they claim that they've measured one thousandth of the diameter of a proton. Now, okay, well, where's your calibration curve to show that you can do that? But it gets worse. Not only have they got no calibration curve, I'll come now to the things that they didn't publish. How did they do it with LIGO? Well, what they've done is this. At that time, they using their general relativity theory and their own assumptions etc they wrote up a library they call it the it's a it's a, a, a of, of templates they call it templates but in reality the templates are just calculated curves are uh, just arbitrarily calculated curves well n not entirely arbitrary because you set the parameters right we've got this kind of a black hole and that kind of a black hole well whether you've got two black holes possible, that's another question. We'll just assume for the sake of argument that you can have two black holes, right? And you'll have a certain output of a black hole and gravitational waves. So they make a whole bunch of curves because in the end, what comes out of their contraption is some curve that they plot. So they made a library of templates. What is a template? Well, it's just the curves that they made up themselves by calculations and they put into the library. Now, what happens is they have what's called a generic noise. A generic noise, right? That's just some noise that comes out of the intestines of LIGO. And they take that noise, using computers, of course, and they try to find a curve of best fit in their library. So uh, is the generic noise the experimental output of the detector? That's, That's what right. they call it? What they say is a signal for a gravitational wave, right? They call it a <laughs> generic <laughs> noise. I kid you not, right? A generic noise. So they take the generic noise and they get their computers to go searching their, their, their library of templates, right, to find a curve of best fit. Well, it doesn't matter how many curves you've got there. You'll find some curve of best fit. It might be a reasonably fit, good fit, or it's a pretty poor fit, but you'll find something because you can find the curve of best fit and you take that out. Then whatever that curve of best fit was is what they say they detected, okay? So how many curves of best fit did they have in their library of templates at the time they made the, or they published their discovery paper of this first alleged LIGO detection? How many do you think? Do you know? Does anybody know? I think it's quite a few. Quite a few. 
Well, there's nothing published, but I know how many, and I've known for quite a long time, and I have the proof of it, right? They had 250,000. They made 250,000 curves by calculation using their computers and put it into a library. Then they get their generic noise and they take that generic noise using those computers to find a curve of best fit in those li- in that library and say that generic noise is actually that one because so they take that curve out and say, oh, what's that? Oh, well, it's that black hole and that black hole colliding to produce this kind of black hole and that much in the way of gravitational waves. So what do they get? Two black holes of certain masses. I forget exactly the numbers. Six solar masses and four solar masses. I'm not quite, you know, it's, it's, it's not that important because it's all rubbish. And at the end of the day, these gravi- the, the, what makes this gravitational wave discussion relevant is that these very expensive experiments, these gravitational waves, are used ultimately for none other than justifying the gaseous model of the stars because what do they detect? They detect these ultra-dense, compact, I don't even know if you can call them objects, these zero-dimensional masses, whatever, and the only way to achieve that is with a gaseous mo- achieve it in theory is with a gaseous model of stars. And so they've kind of gone full circle by creating this very expensive device, which appears to lack calibration and seems to be something of a noise filter to justify the conclusions of the gaseous model and pat themselves on the back, give each other prizes and say, you know, oh, great, the stars are gaseous, just like we thought all along. We can keep carry on and, and keep uh, you know, playing with this idea. This is a 19th century conception that made sense maybe as the technological high point of that culture at the time. The thermodynamicists, the phase diagrams that they had recent access to, but it's super outdated. And, and honestly, it's time to move on. Like, the sun obviously has a surface. We got amateur astronomers on Twitter making incredible pictures of this liquid broth, you know, spewing around the surface. Uh, it, you know, how long can we stomach that it's just an optical illusion? How long can we stomach that an optical illusion is capable of containing the mass of the sun, right? I mean, enough is enough at some point. And if we want to move forward with our interpretation of what is going on when we look up at the sky. If we want to move forward with our energy production potentials here on Earth, you know, let, let's let's call a spade a spade.